Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, 34. Matthew is, is giving commentary on what it is to be a disciple. And he says, and Jesus did not teach them anything without a story. That Jesus used stories to teach stories, parables, that it's, that it's in the story that, that very often God uses to teach us because we have an opportunity to sit and, and, and to look at one character and say, well, that's what I want to emulate or, or to look at another character and say, well, that's uh, whatever. I, I don't want my life to go that way. Or sometimes we might think, well, the story doesn't have anything to do with us. But then the door closes behind us and we realize, oh my, this really was about me. And God uses stories. God uses stories to move us, to make us, to help us see things that we wouldn't normally see. And so Jesus didn't teach them anything without a story. This morning I want to share a story with you. It's a story you may have heard before, the story of Samson. A lot of folks say, well, I know the story of Samson and Delilah. Well, the story of Samson starts long before Delilah. As a matter of fact, the story of Samson starts before there was a Samson. Then an angel of the Lord goes to Samson's mother, tells her that she's going to have a child and this child is going to be a Nazarite. Now, you might not know what a Nazarite is or what that means, and neither did his mother. So the angel explained it to her. There are three things that set aside a Nazarite. A Nazarite is set aside for God, so a Nazarite, doesn't drink strong drink. Not now, not ever. Second thing is a Nazarite, well, a Nazarite stays pure and only eats foods that are, that, that are clean and it doesn't touch any animal that's, that's unclean. In other words, possum's not on the menu. It's an unclean animal and the, 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 her son would not eat possum. Or roadkill, that the, the, touching uh, a carcass of a dead animal, that's unclean. And the third thing, being a Nazarite means that his hair will never be cut. It meant that it, his whole life he looked like an unmade bed. And it was, it was a part of being set aside. People could, rec from a distance, they might say, well, that fellow looks like an unmade bed. Well, he must be a Nazarite then. So... Samson's mother-to-be went to go tell Samson's father-to-be. His name was Manoah. Went to tell her husband and said, we're going to have a baby. We've wanted one for so long. And, and the angel of the Lord told me. And so the father goes to, to the angel and says, we don't know anything about raising a child. Tell us, how do we raise the baby? And that's when the angel says, do what your wife says and listen to her. <laughs> Which is, is not a bad recommendation at all. Well, it goes on. This is in Judges, chapters 13 through 16. It tells us that, that Samson to be, began to, to grow in the Spirit of the Lord. 
And you would think that a child being set aside, a child that's announced by an angel, a, a child that the, the Spirit of the Lord began to, to grow in, you would think that that child would be on the road to sainthood. But when chapter 14 starts off, Samson's not on the road to sainthood. He's on the road to Timnah. And there's anything but sainthood in Timnah. There's nothing but Philistines in Timnah. And the Philistines had been beating the stuffing out of the Israelites for more than 40 years. And now he's going down to be surrounded by the Philistines. And he's walking down the road and he lays his eyes on this, this woman and, and he falls in love. He goes back and tells his, his father, get her for me. His father says, Samson, Samson. Oy vey, or he said something like that anyway. There are all these good Israelite girls and you fall in love with, a, with a, a, a Philistine girl. This just can't turn out well at all. Samson repeats it again, get her for me. So the father goes down to meet the girl's father and Samson comes later and as he's coming down the, the, the road to Timna, that a lion attacks him. And the spirit of the Lord came on Samson and he he killed the lion, tore the lion apart, threw his carcass in the bushes, left for dead. And he goes down to visit the father. And when he, he, he goes back home to prepare for the wedding, that he looks around and he says, Well, I know I killed the lion around here somewhere, and I don't want to touch him or anything, because, you know, he's a Nazarite, and he, he just wants to poke him with a stick. And you know how much fun it is to poke dead things with a stick. I know I like it. I'm sure you do too. So he, he looks for it. He finds the carcass. But now, inside the carcass, bees have made a nest, and there's honey, all kinds of honey. So he reaches all the way on the inside of this this unclean carcass and he, he pulls out honey and he, there's, he's enjoying the honey he takes some home to his parents and his parents say where'd you get the honey he said at the getting place they said sure is good so, so then his father goes down and he, he provides the meal for the, this, this wedding that's, that's going and it's a, a week long feast Samson's there and, and his bride-to-be has invited 30 of her cousins, all Philistines, and they're giving Samson the business. And he says, okay, okay, okay. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a riddle. And if you can answer my riddle, then um, I'll buy each of you a suit of clothes, 30 suits of clothes. But if you can't answer my riddle, then you have to give me 30 suits of clothes. And I like linen by the way well he's, they say how hard could this be he's an Israelite he's dumb as a post and you know we're used to whipping up on them anyway so go ahead give us your riddle he says out of the eater came something to eat out of the strong came something sweet well it's a little tougher than what they thought Three days go by and they still haven't guessed his riddle. And then it dawns on them. Where are they going to get 30 suits of clothes? Well, it means they're going to have to walk home naked. That this whole thing is just to, to humiliate them, just to embarrass them. So they go to the bride-to-be, their cousin, and they say, Hey, you've got to, to tell us his secret, you, the secret to the riddle. And she says, I don't, I don't know the answer to the riddle. We'll ask him. So she asks him, Hey, Samson. What a, what's the answer to your riddle? Samson says, well, I didn't tell my parents. Why should I tell you? So she begins to cry. Well, Samson has a soft place for tears. And so he says, okay, 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 okay. He said, when I was going back up home, he said, I had killed this lion. And inside the lion, bees had made honey. And so that's the riddle. It's, it's lion and honey. Out of the eater, that's the lion, came something to eat. That's honey. Out of the strong, that's the lion, came something sweet. That's honey. Get it? Lion, honey. She goes, oh yeah, I get it. Well, she told her cousins. It was seven days later. And Samson's ready to be, to, to receive his, his new linen suits. And for them to, to walk home naked. And he says, and, and, and by the way, it's about time for you to start giving me your clothes. And that's when they said, well, give us one more try. You know, we got to thinking about it. About the only thing that it could be is a lion and honey. Well, Samson is furious. 
And he says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have guessed my riddle. Well, <laughs> a, a little bit of marriage counseling for you. If you start off the marriage by calling your wife-to-be a heifer, it's not going to go well. Just that's one of those things that just mark it off the list. No bueno. It's not going to go well. So Samson gets furious. He's got to come up with 30 suits of clothes. So what does he do? He kills 30 of the wedding guests and he gives them their clothes. Well, that's marriage counseling number two. If you start off the marriage with killing 30 of your wife's family, it's not going to go well. It's just not the way to start. So he storms off and he goes back home. Then he realizes, well, maybe I kind of lost my head a little bit and I, I need to take her a gift and, and we'll go ahead and get married. So he takes her a goat, gives it to her father, and her father says, well, sorry, but we thought you were gone and she married the best man. <laughs> and then her father says, but you're in luck. She has a little sister and she's even cuter than, than the, you know, the woman you were going to marry. And, and, and you can have her younger sister. Well, Samson gets furious. So he catches 300 foxes and he ties their tails together. And in between their tails, he puts a torch. Well, nobody can get close to a, a fox without being bitten. And 300 foxes with their tails tied together. And they start running through and they burn down all the crops and they burn down the town. And, and a thousand Philistine men rise up with one purpose and one purpose only. And that purpose is to kill Samson. Well, they can't find him. It's a problem. <coughs> He's hiding so they go to the Israelites and they say, tell you what, you find Samson, deliver him to us or we'll start killing Israelites. We'll kill you all. So they find Samson. He's in the cleft of the rock and they say, Samson, Samson, oy vey. Or something like that. They say, they're going to kill us if, 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 if we don't turn you in. So they tie him up and they take him back to the Philistines. And there, when they deliver him over to the Philistines, Samson breaks the rope. And he finds a dead donkey and he gets the skull of the dead donkey and he smote them all. Killed all thousand of them. Just smote them right there. And you'd think the story would, would be over right then, but it's not. The next we see Samson, he's not on the road to Timnah, he's on the road to Gaza. Now, if, if you think they're Philistines in Timnah, they're a hundred times more Philistines in Gaza. And he's just flirting with disaster. Things didn't go well before, but now they're gonna, they have to go even worse. And you guessed it. He's walking down the road in Gaza and he lays his eyes on a woman and he falls deeply in love with Delilah. Well, the, the men in Gaza, they, they know about Samson. And they don't want the same thing to go for them the way that it went for the people in Timnah. So what they do is they go to Delilah and say, make him tell you his secret. So she asks him, Samuel, what, what's the secret of your strength? He said, well, the secret is if I'm tied up with seven bowstrings, I'm just as weak as any man. Six, I can snap in a heartbeat. At seven, I, I just can't break it. So they, she says, like this, and she ties him up with seven bowstrings. He says, just like that. Then she cries out, the Philistines are here. Well, the Philistines come in, and Samson breaks the seven bowstrings, and he smote them all. And he just laughs and laughs, and she cries and cries, and she says, you don't love me. He said, of course I love you. She said, no, if you loved me, you'd tell me your secret. He says, okay, well, it's not the bowstrings, it's new rope. If you tie me up with new rope, I'm just as weak as any other man. She says, like this, and so she ties his, him up with, with a new rope. He says, just like that. So she cries out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. And then, so the Philistines come in, and he breaks the new rope, and he smote them all. And he laughs and laughs, and she cries and cries, and she says, you don't love me. He says, of course I love you. She said, no, if you love me, you'd tell me your secret. He says, okay, okay, it's, it's not in a new rope. It's not in the seven bowstrings. It's in my hair. Well, now he is flirting with disaster. But he doesn't quite tell her the truth. He says, you know, 
my hair, if, if, if you weave it into a little rug, now I realize this sounds pretty weird, but that's what it says, is if you weave my hair into a little rug and you secure it with a pin, I can't shake loose of the weaver's beam and the weaver's loom and... And I'm, I'm just as weak as any man. I'm, I'm attached to that weaver's loom and I, I can't shake loose. So he falls asleep and she begins to, to weave his hair into a little rug. And, that's, and then she secures it with, with, with a pin. And, and then she cries out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are here. And that's when he wakes up. He, he pulls out the pin and he shakes the, the weaver's loom loose. And he smote them all. And he laughs and laughs and she cries and cries. And she says, you don't love me. He said, of course I love you. She says, no, if you love me, you would tell me your secret. And she cries and cries and cries. And that's when Samson, <laughs> that's when Samson says in verse 16, this woman is going to nag me to death. You might have wondered where that saying came from. It came from Judges chapter 16, verse 16. That woman is going to nag me to death. So, <laughs> Rather than nag him to death, he tells her his secret. My strength is in my hair. And if I have my hair, my hair's never been cut. And if my hair's cut, then I'm just as weak as anyone else. Well, he falls asleep. And then she gets the barber to come in and to cut his hair. Well, no longer does he look like an unmade bed. Instead, he looks like a skinned rabbit. And she cries out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are, are here. Well, the Philistines rush in. And that's when in verse 20, Judges 16, verse 20, Samson says, And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. This story has a word for us. And that word is a word of blessing. God has provided for, for you and me great blessing. And that God didn't wait till Samson was good enough or better than he had been or until Samson was perfect. That, that the Spirit of God was in Samson before he was perfect. Before he was better than he had been. And that, that God has surrounded you and me with, with blessing. Great blessing. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That the riches of God are, are all around us. And, and Samson never recognized the riches of God. He never recognized the blessing of God. And not only does, does this story provide for us that word of blessing, it also provides for us that, that word of warning. That word of warning. Samson presumed the grace of God. Presumed that it would always be there. Presumed that no matter what he did and where he went, that it would always be with him. That it's in the the praise, in the gratitude, it's in the recognition that we, we, have, we have eyes to see, that we have ears to hear, that we have hearts that will receive the blessing, the grace, the power of God. Well, it'd be quite a story if it ended right there, but it doesn't. It keeps going. That there's not just the word of blessing and the word of warning. That there's the, the word of hope. That Samson was captured by the Philistines. They blinded him. They put him in prison. They, they put him in, in bronze, bronze chains. And there it says that they made sport. Of Samson. It means that they, at their fun, at their whim, they humiliated him. They beat him up. They beat the stuffing out of him whenever they wanted to. But at the very end of the story, Samson's heart has changed. And what Samson does for the first time in, in the whole of the story, 
is that he prays in verse 28, please remember me and strengthen me just this time. And that's what God does. He strengthens Samson and Samson's used to pull down the pillars of the, the Philistine temple, of the pagan temple. Well, the word of hope, the word of hope is that you can never go too far from the grace of God. That there's hope. That there's hope for, for you and for me. And hope has a name and that name is Jesus. Jesus tells us that, that all of the scripture bears witness to him. And, and hope Hope has a name. That name is Jesus. That on the cross, what Jesus did for you and for me, he took all those things that would destroy us. He took the pride. That he took the fear. He took the shame. He took the stubbornness. He took the addiction. He took all those things that would conquer us and destroy us and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power. Once and for all. And when he rose from the grave, he rose that he might live his life through, through you and through me. To give us a strength that we don't have on our own. This is what scripture says in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. That it's a new life, a new road, a fresh start. That the risen Christ offers to you and to me. Hope. Hope is what he, Hope has a name. And the name is Jesus. This morning. It may be. That um. When you came here. You felt like you were at the end of the road. That. You'd been following a road that left, led to destruction, that led to defeat, and led to despair. Jesus doesn't leave you at the end of that road. He's provided a, a new road, a new way, a new path, and the name is Jesus. And he, we, we don't just follow his example. He lives his life through us. That it's his strength and his power. The power of the overcomer that, that is alive in, in, in you and me. That leads us to a new life. As a new creature. Where Jesus lives his life through us. This morning it may be that you followed a road. And that road wasn't necessarily the, the road to despair or destruction. But it was a road where you worked hard at doing the right thing, at doing the moral thing, at doing the good thing. But this road instead has left you a place where you're empty. And your life doesn't have meaning. And you've done all the right things. Here's the good news, there's hope. Hope. That the risen Christ rose from the grave to live his life through you and me. That we might be a new creature, a new creation, a fresh start. Where he lives his life through you. And I'd like to pray with you this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, I don't know where, where everyone is, but you do. I don't know the roads that they fought, but you do. I don't know what folks have done or where they've been, but you do. And Jesus, you give us that word of hope this morning. You don't wait till we're good as we could be or better than we had been. You give us that blessing, that hope now, this day. Give us strength enough to begin to praise, to give gratitude, to give honor to you. And, and that our eyes be changed where we see you in all things every day, starting this day. Lord, it may be that, that we've followed a road and that, that, 
that you found us in this story. You found us at that place where the word of warning is you've shaken us. You've nudged us. You've given us thump on the head and that, that word of warning is the, the word that, that we need this day. We've been following our wants and our desires and flirting with the disaster and we've been presuming your grace that will always be there. Jesus, breathe the fresh wind of your spirit, not one day, but this day into our lives, that we might know your peace, your power, and your joy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.